guys. You, you click it in. Okay. Just click and then click further. Starting. Just follow my text.
Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Welcome to the fourth evening of the Belgian ICT Community Week. Um, this is our evening for the Microsoft Cloud and Client Management Community. We are uh, the last community in a row. Uh, last but not least, um, before we kick off, we have like yeah, about five minutes where we want to give people the chance to, to join us. Um, before we kick off, a small introduction of our uh, community, which we founded at the beginning of this year. So who are we? Who are the guys uh, behind the community and also behind the organization of this specific event? Uh, my name is Tim, Tim de Keukelare, and with me I have the rest of the, uh, the board of our community. Uh, Wim, Tim, Peter, Ken, Jasper, the other Peter, and Micha. So we are, um, we're all present here tonight um, to give you this, uh, the, the sessions. So what is the mission of our community? Um, of course, our main focus is on sharing knowledge and also providing a platform for like-minded technology enthusiasts to share information and tips and tricks, uh, to ask questions, so basically to learn from each other and to have uh, a good time. Typically, we do our events in person, so this is the first time we are doing um, a, a, uh, yeah, a virtual event uh, given the current COVID-19 uh, circumstances. So uh, our main pillars, uh, Wim, maybe you can uh, highlight the first one. It's okay. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, our first pillar is uh, the Microsoft Cloud, where we will not only focus and talk about Azure, uh, but also cover uh, all Microsoft hybrid solutions. Uh, so topics uh, range from Azure EAS to PaaS and SaaS, uh, but we also keep an eye on Hyper-V and uh, the complete Windows Server landscape. Uh, yeah, we share knowledge, give advice about implementations, and uh, this way we with a strong focus on uh, security. So next pillar, back to you, Tim. Yeah. So and our second big pillar is of course related to client management, uh, endpoint management, and now again also uh, endpoint security. So focusing from a product perspective on the Microsoft 365 product stack, uh, the EMS suite, Windows 10, and the Defender ATP um, products. So that's uh, where we also tend to focus on. Um, we are an open community. We are organizing regular events, and we're always looking for good content and good speakers uh, to put on stage. So we have a continuous call for speakers. If you have an interest in, in presenting a session or something that you've learned or you want to share with the community, um, please submit your IDs. So the, uh, this is done through a tool called Sessionize, an online tool. The URLs are on the, uh, on the slide deck. Yeah. If you have any further questions about that, please reach out to any of the guys you saw in the introduction slide deck uh, and we'll be happy to help you out and give you more information. Do we have more so, online presence? Yeah, we're, so just like all the other user groups, we're also on all the different social media channels. Uh, first of all, we have a website. Uh, where we announce all our events with upcoming speakers, but uh, some of us also blog on it. Uh, so be sure to check that one out. The links are also on the deck, so click on it afterwards. Uh, we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, where we announce all our events or retweet or share about uh, specific topics in the complete Microsoft Cloud ecosystem. Uh, we also have a Facebook page and a closed uh, Facebook group. Uh, where people can post about their blogs. So if you have an interesting uh, blog about uh, Azure or the Microsoft 365, you can also, also post it on there. Um, and the last one, we're also on Instagram, but yeah, uh, there are not a lot of pictures on it yet. So uh, that's the thing we need to work on it. Um, and we are really nothing without uh, the community around us. So uh, help us, follow us, share posts, and uh, yeah, definitely retweet everything. Tim, can you go on to the next slide, please? Yes. If so can... our events, yeah, on a schedule in 2020, we have uh, the next one is the spring edition. It's on the 28th of May. Um, you can already register on our website. So if you're interested, just go on. And yeah, probably it will be an online event again. And uh, hopefully in our summer edition, in the 27th of in August, we can do anything live again and then we also have it at the end of the year we have an autumn edition on the 26th of november so save those dates and uh, be sure to check out our website uh, for the upcoming speakers and uh, topics okay thanks Wim. um so yeah 
On the agenda for tonight, we have a guest speaker from uh, Switzerland. That's Mirko, Mirko Kolenberg. Uh, I'm sure he will introduce himself uh, at the beginning of his session. Um, so yeah, on the workplace side of things, he's a, a dual MVP, if we can call it like that. So MVP in the uh, enterprise mobility and also a Windows Insider MVP. And yeah, the last topic, Beer Brewer, I'm sure he will elaborate on that during his introduction as well. Um, after that first session, we will have a small break and then we have our second speaker. Uh, that's one of our own people, uh, that's Peter the Tender, who will talk about deploying a static website uh, on Azure. So um, Peter will do a short introduction of himself before his session as well. So that's what we have uh, for the agenda. And then one more slide, Wim, for you. Yeah, for the housekeeping. Um, so if you have any questions about, uh, yeah, the presenters are on the topic. You can ask your question in the Q&A and then the moderator will ask him at the presenter itself. We also have a virtual coffee break in between uh, both sessions. Um, in the end, we have also, uh, we will uh, announce the evils. So we hope you can fill them in so we can uh, yeah, make our next events even better. Um, at the end, we also have a virtual uh, social event after the sessions. Uh, the link will, uh, be placed in the Q&A at the end, and uh, we hope you can bring your own drinks then. Um, most of all, have fun and uh, enjoy the content, and then uh, I leave the word to Mirko, I think. OK, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me and uh, for uh, this first time as a virtual event. Um, <clears throat> During this uh, special time, we have also this special time in Switzerland. So yeah, let's see what's happened in a few weeks or months or maybe a year. We will see. So I will share my screen here. Um, um, I will talk about uh, this evening uh, about <clears throat> rule-based access control, RBAC, and more in Intune. That means a little bit of rights management instead of using uh, global admins all over uh, and everyone can do what they like to do. Um, that's not a good idea and I will cover uh, a little bit of that to help you guys to find the right, the right direction, how it works and uh, what you can do. So first of all, um, yes, I'm a beer brewer. Uh, thank you for the introduction, that from Tim. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm also a beer sommelier, uh, a Swiss beer sommelier. Uh, that's the yellow sign, and uh, also an international beer sommelier. That's the the grey sign, and this is uh, uh, one of my beers. If you see my background, uh, maybe you have expected those are my hops that I use. Uh, um, from the uh, fence outside uh, because those are from the from the neighbor and it grows on my side so I can use it. Uh, I ask him for sure, but yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, here's some details from my side. I would say um, the crew will share the stuff. After that, I will give it, uh, send it to them. Um, then you have my contact details. If you have any question uh, afterwards, uh, just ask. OK, so here, um, <clears throat> first of all, about the rights management or handling rights management uh, for uh, building or if you start with a new tenant, you can do that. Um, uh, and the most important thing is if you have an admin portal, um, yeah, every user can sign in at the admin portal and you can <laughs> and you can have uh, <clears throat> Uh, an overview of anything. I just want to like to show you that one. Uh, that's why I quickly jump into the demo. So here I have a browser open with my global administrator. That's my minion view. And if I go to um, Azure Active Directory, uh, the first thing uh, what I have to do is <clears throat> in my uh, login to the azure uh, portal.azure.com for sure then i go to my active the azure active directory and here in the <clears throat> in the user area in the user settings i have some options 
And there is one important option, and this is calling administration portal, uh, restrict access to Azure AD administration portal. And this is basically a default value is no. And that means when I open another browser with another user, so here I have my test user. This user is just a regular user. He has no rights in my in my uh, tenant. He's he's not a global admin. He is not in any group. The only thing what I have done is I add a license uh, to that uh, user that he can uh, use uh, Intune for education um, <clears throat> and also uh, Office 365 and stuff like that. So when I now as this user log in and I go to um, Azure Active Directory, so I have the possibility to log into the portal.azure.com. So that's uh, the biggest thing. And now I can see I can go as user um, and see the other users. You can see um, all the users are listed here. I can go and uh, have a look on Mara. For sure, I can't manipulate uh, that much but I can look. I have read writes all over. So if you go back and set this uh, restrict access to Azure Active Directory, uh, say yes, and then we have to, um, to save that option, save it here. <clears throat> there is another, uh, another important uh, um, option for exter external users. Um, manage external collaboration settings. If you open this one, there are some other fancy settings because guest users' permission are limited. Yes, admins and user in a guest uh, invert invite role can invite. So other guests can also invite some more guests, and I don't like to do that because the default value is yes. So I set it to no. Members can invite. No, I would like to have the control who has access in my tenant or maybe also for for teams invites. I would control that because otherwise I have a lot of people, guests in my tenant and uh, it, it looks like a big mess. So and guests can invite. Um, I said that to no. So that's the basic settings I have to do in my tenant. And now I go back um, to my uh, other user, to my test user, and now I have to log, log off first, sign out and log in again, and then the, right will, the rights will be applied. Uh, it needs a logout and a login again. Um, it's like the old school um, Active Directory users. Sometimes you have to log off and log on again to get the right. So now I sign in again. Yes. Yeah, you can blame on me on this is my test tenant. I don't use MFA for that. That's another important uh, thing to implement first. Um, but now when I go to oops, to Azure Active Directory, sorry, that was the wrong button. Uh, I go back <coughs> and open Intune. Not Intune again, <laughs> come on. <laughs> OK, I open Azure Active Directory here. So and now you can see in the first view, it more stuff is grayed out than in the first. You can see, so I can't open any users, no access. So and that's the most important part uh, when you start with that thing. So next um, we want to go do uh, go a little bit deeper. Um, for uh, rule-based access control. So that uh, the scenario is the following. First of all, you have to create a members a group, a member group, and <clears throat> those are uh, like administrators for special roles. Next, you have to, you can create a role like an Intune administrator role. This role is already existing. If you like to create your own roles with special rights, uh, then you need to have a P2 license for Azure Active Directory to create your own roles, like job profile based roles. Then we have the scope tags. Uh, scope tags is to tag something uh, that I can uh, later use or this role or group member with the specific role and specific tag. 
can only see or open and manipulate those um, like policies or stuff like that that has the special tag on it. And then we have the scope group that contains users or computers that you like to manage. So with your job profile, you have to manage maybe a classroom. So for example, I use in this uh, slides or in this uh, <clears throat> presentation example from a school, like I have a teacher and the teacher has a right to only wipe devices, for example. And that I will cover in this session that you have a real life example. You can also use that for your examples uh, in your company, like for your help desk administrators or for your uh, engineers, second level engineers, etc., etc. So if this is uh, too confusing for everyone, um, we have an additional new one that's uh, just in preview. Uh, I would like to show you that a little bit uh, later. Uh, administrative units, units uh, covers a lot of those things together, but you have to build that, uh, that, uh, uh, that stuff on the slide before, like uh, <laughs> that stuff on the slide before, like the role, the scopes, uh, scope tags and scope group, you have to create that anyway. But then you can use the administrative units. The administrative units are cool for restricting departments or region or some segment of your organization. For example, if you have a, a big campus, um, uh, like a university and you have some different roles in place that uh, you have administrators for a special uh, community at your college um, that then you can uh, use the administrative units uh, to, to give this administrator the possibility to only manage those devices for that community or for that part of the community. Yeah? So now it must be clear or not clear. Um, yeah, I have some details um, that makes it a little bit simpler for you to understand. So I have, uh, first of all, um, when we have all those things, um, we need to create groups, Azure Active Directory groups, uh, two of them in minimum, because First of all, I will select a group of people. They have the possibility to administrate other things in, in, uh, in Intune. Then we need a group of other people or a group of devices that those people, the administrators can manage. Then we have to create a role, a job profile role for those administrators. And then we have to have uh, tags, what they can do in our tenant or in, in our Intune. And in the end, we put all those together in an assignment because, because we have an assignment where we add the tags, the member group, the scope group, and also a role. And then all things will get together and you have your final, um, final uh, management uh, roles where can people like administrators or teacher can manage their classroom and stuff like that. So to make it a little bit simpler, um, because it's a little bit confusing now, still um, it takes a while. First of all, I have scope tags. I have to create the scope tag first because a scope tag has to be created after that, I can select. In this example, I created the scope tag with the name Classroom 2. And uh, if I have a lot of classrooms with shared devices, for example, or I have a, a Mediatek or a Bibliotek, a library um, that uses a kiosk PCs or stuff like that, or there is also some people uh, managing the library, um, they have also computers, so you can create a group or first of all, you have to create the scope that you can assign the scope to that group later on. So it's like um, a tag is something like a key to access your house. So then we have a scope tag on a device, but this is no more available in the in the big screen with uh, 
uh, when you open the properties of a device that are managed in Intune, um, in the earlier days, you can go to every single device and add a scope. So there was no possibility to uh, add a scope to a group with a lot of devices inside. Uh, in the meantime, Microsoft changed that. And what's uh, new is that you only can add a scope tag to a group of devices. So that's um, a scope tags. Then we have a scope group. A scope group means there are some users or devices to manage. That means I have a horde of people with a lot of devices and you would like to manage those people. No, you would like to manage those devices, but of course you can also manage the people with conditional access, what they can do on the device and stuff like that. Uh, it's pretty simple. So, and then we have member group. Member group is in the naming of people. Those are like personas. They have the right to manage the other group of people. That means like the administrators. So that's me on the right side and uh, some co-workers of mine. And in the background, uh, there are some other fancy people. And <clears throat> those are the crew that manages the devices as like those are teachers, for example. Then we have the role, the role itself. I can create my own role. As I said, you need an Azure Premium P2, um, a license for managing your own role, and or otherwise you can only use the specific roles that are already uh, implemented from Microsoft. So the roles are like, um, are like uh, job profiles. Is it like a head desk administrator or is it an engineer or or whatever? What, what, what possibilities uh, have, uh, have to be in that role to manage devices or manage conditional access rules and stuff like that? So when we create the role, I will break here and go and show you how to create the role because first of all when I go back <clears throat> in my Azure Active Directory you have here role and uh, roles and administrators this is a preview uh, roles and administrators this is uh, new in Azure Active Directory. Uh, otherwise, you have to go to the other ad ad administration portal and add those uh, roles here, uh, there. But here are some uh, global roles, not uh, like uh, application developer, application administrators, cloud uh, device administrators. You have cloud application, you have uh, Dynamics 365 and um, here we have the global administrator or the global reader and stuff like that. And you have like help desk administrators and stuff for um, Kaisala, uh, Kaisala administrator, license administrator. So those roles are um, pre-integrated from Microsoft. That's the name here built in. But um, if we scroll up a little bit so you can see the Intune administrator. If you would like to have uh, like uh, an engineer or a senior engineer a group of them, um, they are managing the whole Intune, you can just add them the role as the um, as the Intune administrator. So you can uh, easily select that role, add and assign um, add an assignment to that role and then um, you can just use your uh, you the users or you can also search for for group uh, in my example i have some security groups or not um, let's try it here uh, scroll down a little bit uh, maybe i forgot my search pattern da, 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 da. Only 50. <laughs> Please include a search term. Um, let me use the class as a search. It's not here. Okay. So I skipped that for a moment because 
um, this is an Intune role administrators. If you want to go the easy way, uh, instead of giving everyone the, the global administrator, you can just say, OK, those are the Intune administrators and that's enough for them. I don't need RBAC in place. Uh, but to be honest, if you give rights like administrative rights uh, on a special thing uh, in Azure Active Directory, uh, you have to integrate PIM, Privileged Identity Management. I really can recommend, I don't like uh, to explain that too much uh, now because that's a totally different story. Uh, PIM basically is a user that has the right as an Intune administrator has first to go to the specific uh, tenant plate and ask to have the rights as an Intune administrator now for the next two or three or four hours. And you can also integrate there an approval process that someone has to approve that uh, request or you have the possibility to say, OK, it's OK when the when the user that asked for that permission just have to add something in a description file and then he can get the access. So PIM is really recommended if you have uh, the um, <clears throat> only one account and not like two accounts. One is for administrating things and the other one is just for reading mails and uh, surfing in the Internet and stuff like that. And uh, but this is really uh, on top of the whole thing, uh, like you can manage not, not only the, the Intune administrators, the PIM is uh, available for all the roles. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, then we can we have to go to Intune and in Intune, we have separate roles because those are separate to manage uh, like devices, like users and stuff like that. So for that, I have here um, the section roles. And as an administrator or also as an Intune administrator, I can manage the roles. So here for the roles, I can go and those are also built in roles. You can see this. So now I would like to create a role. And I say, this role will be for teachers to manage classroom devices. Oops. So, OK, then I click next. Then I have the possibility for the permission. So. <clears throat> Come on, refresh. So now, uh, as an example, um, I can go and say, OK, I have some remote task. This job role, um, I will like to allow clean PCs. So the help here is very helpful because it says the same as is written there. Uh, not all of those, but uh, the most of them <laughs> uh, sense not a really a good um, um, explanation what it means. But here for send custom notification, this is a, a, a option that you can send custom notifications directly to Android devices. So I se select this too. Then I have also clean PC, but the most important for my teachers in, in that role would be on the very bottom, I allow him to wipe devices. So now I say yes, then I have say next. And now I can add a scope tag. This is, maybe you saw that on other wizards to add scope tags and uh, we will use that later. But in this case, to managing a role, you can also add a scope tag and let specific admins like security administrators manage those roles. So only those people can change something uh, what's allowed for me then to administrate in the whole environment, right? OK, so we let it empty now. And then we have next and an overview. So here are the remote tasks and notification, clean PC and wipe. Then we say create. OK. And after that creation, we go ahead and the next uh, part will be scope tag. Scope tag, for example, 
I create the scope tag. That means name a uh, class room uh, Fritz. So the classroom Fritz is a special classroom for people uh, for maybe for uh, if they have no lessons, the students, they can go in the classroom Fritz and uh, they have a, a library there or Mediatek or whatever. So and now I can add include groups and here I have to add a group with those devices in it. In it. So now I forgot to create that uh, classroom. I have some other classrooms, but I forgot to create this classroom. So I can skip this and I can go back later and add the assignment for this scope. So that's what, what I was uh, explaining from the slide before. Uh, before you have, um, uh, before this, you had to go to every single device with the properties and add the scope tag. So now I go back to, to my Intune uh, blade and I go to groups and I just create a new group for my Fritz uh, classroom devices. All groups, new group. So, and in this case, I would like to create the dynamic group. Um, I just give it the name, uh, security group name is classroom Fritz. And uh, I don't need a description now. And I say, OK, that's for dynamic devices. Add, di whoops, add a dynamic query. The dynamic query uh, is a simple, so you can use different uh, options here from the properties for dynamic queries. I just use um, the device OS type and I choose an operator. I say uh, contains. And then I say uh, Windows. So this is a pretty simple uh, query because it will add all Windows devices to this uh, to this group. Um, then I create it, and now I have to watch here successfully created. So my query is running. So now I can go back to my uh, roles and go to my scope and go to my classroom Fritz and now I can uh, add an assignment, edit by the assignment to include the group. And now I can select the group with the classroom Fritz. Oops. So here we go with the classroom Fritz. Mirko, I just have one, one interesting, interesting session. Session. Uh, question. Uh, question. Yes. What is in your regard the best practice? Admin with your regular accounts using PIM or a separate admin account? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, in the past, to be honest, um, I, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain some uh, customer examples, but I can use our company as an example. Um, first, uh, in, the, in the earlier days, uh, two years or so ago, PIM was really slow. And at that time, we used two accounts, uh, a regular account and an admin account. But now today, uh, we are moving away and using PIM more and more uh, with only one account and uh, with the different rights, with approval process, with Power Apps and stuff like that in the back end. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. OK, back to the slides. We have uh, review and save because now we tagged our classroom. That means every device in this classroom is tagged. So now and um, we can also go and for example, um, just to show you uh, where are scope tags involved when I go, for example, uh, for a device compliance. Uh, I will create a device compliance policy. I just click through that you can see where uh, in the end of a wizard are um, coming up uh, the, the question about scope tags. So here we have the platform like I have Android for enterprise devices using in my school for that with a, a device a work profile. Uh, it's like for shared computers, um, Android computers, for example, in my in my school. 
And now I can, I give it the name. I say these are uh, Fritz Android devices. So then I know those are from the Fritz classroom and I can select something, um, just add here one, one easy button and then go next. Next, actions for non-compliant, mark the uh, device as non-compliant, that's okay. Say next, and now I have the possibility to add a scope tag. So those teachers have with that tag that I just add now from my list of the tags, um, those teachers can now also um, manipulate this um, uh, this uh, policy that I just created with adding this scope tag. So I don't assign uh, this uh, this um, uh, policy now. It was just an example um, where you can see the scope tags, and now maybe you 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 have a aha scope tags are for this kind of use. So and then <clears throat> uh, we go back, and now we have also to create another group because we need the administrators. So I go back to the groups and say a group, uh, a new group. Now I make it uh, a group, a security group, give it the name and say those are my teachers. I can add all my teachers or I can simplify with uh, full-time employed teachers or part-time employed teachers, whatever you like. Then um, I do a direct assignment now because I add my test user um, going for that to my users looking for my test user. Open the test user and go to the groups. So I now add my test user to the group. Teachers, select. So now this user is in the in the group teachers. So now when I go back and I will um, log off and log on again with this user. So this user would like to log off. Sign out. OK, so what I what I have done is I create the group, I created the, the, the tags, I created the role. So there is one important piece that I already forgot to do because um, I need to assign to bring together all those uh, specific pieces, right? So for that kind, I just like to show you without an assignment of all those um, without an assignment of all those uh, pieces to bring all those pieces together, it's not possible. It's still not possible to, to get more rights. So this test user has no like Intune administrative rights from my Azure tenant, and it has no other rights at the moment. Still, it's it is just in this group of teachers. So when I go to Intune. I like to open Intune now as a teacher. And now and now and now. Too many live meetings at the moment, maybe. So uh, when I go to device compliance. At the moment, this user has still no rights. <clears throat> so
so we can see unauthorized. So first I will like to log off now for this user again and go back as an administrator. And now I go back here in Intune and go back to the roles. Uh, all roles. Go to my teachers role. And now I have to create this assignment here in the properties. You still have the possibility to add some more rights. But here in the assignment, I have now bring together all those pieces. So first, first of all, I can assign. And just in the in the meantime, uh, this role that I just created, I can use that role also if, if uh, for example, I have different uh, buildings where are on my campus and I have different teachers. They have the role that they can wipe devices in a classroom. Uh, you can use that role for multiple uh, use. So you just have to add some different as assignments. But I don't know what's happened here now with this uh, overview. So, ah, okay. Um, so now I have to give this assignment uh, a name. I say those are um, teacher to monarch. Uh, to manage the class room um, fritz. Then I say next. So now I can select the admin group. That means my teachers, because those are the admins. So it's pretty slow today. I'm sorry for that. Then I select my teacher or my admin group. Then I have to add my scope group. Select the scope group. I can also use all, all user, all devices. Huh? Um, select groups to include. Um, for that, I have built my classroom, my classroom Fritz group. Say select. And now I can add scope tags. So here with the assignment, bring anything together using Fritz as my scope tag. And then we have next. Create. So now, oh, there is a typo. <laughs> OK, so you can go anytime to the properties of the assignment and edit uh, whatever you like. So you can add some more groups. Uh, you can add or uh, delete some groups. So save and review, save. So now, OK. So now we have the complete thing together. Um, I go back and log in with the test user again to get the rights. So let's see what's happened. So now the teacher or test user goes to uh, Intune. So in Intune, we should now see unauthorized. <laughs> so I can't see the policy. So sometimes that happens because it needs some time for replication in the background. So I will show you the other way around uh, for devices. So you can't see all devices. That's also sad. <laughs> so now I have <laughs> I have to use the, the whole other way. 
uh, going to Azure Active Directory. Um, going there to my devices. Yeah. I don't have access to Azure Active Directory, so there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I forgot something, maybe, or I just have to wait for those. Um, okay, to go back, yes, I, now I remember what I forgot. Um, when I go back to the role, <laughs> um, in the properties of the rights, I have to give the read write for devices. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Uh, is there any question in the meantime, Tim? No further questions so far. Okay. So here in the managed devices, I will give him the read writes. And um, what else? Uh, da, 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 da. Also for my compliance policy. Da, da, da. Uh, the, the device configuration, device enrollment. Here, device compliance policy. I have to give the right for read. Huh? So. I think that should be done now. Uh, just let's check the other organization. Here, organization, uh, read. So, and uh, as I remember correctly, that should be done now. So, let's save it. Save again. Okay, going back, um, I have to log off for sure. Um, so I'm still in time, Tim, or? Sure, you sure. still have some 10 minutes, yeah. Do, do I have to hurry up? So hopefully, just a few seconds. Um, yeah, I can go through the slides um, a little bit more. Um, there is all anything described. And uh, what I like to, um, as a last part, to uh, tell you guys, um, there are also some PowerShell scripts available on the um, PowerShell Intune sample on GitHub. You can use this for like get uh, RBOC uh, permissions, export and stuff like that to have an overview who has what right and what group and stuff like that. Uh, you can grab those information all from GitHub. And uh, there is also Intune PowerShell module where some RBOC uh, stuff is in there uh, to use that. Uh, to automate some processes that you can have an overview from time to time. Oh, is there changed something? Are uh, new users in this group as uh, administrators or help desk administrators and so on? So that's the thank you. But uh, I hope, I really hope I can show you that uh, little piece. Um, otherwise, the whole demo makes no sense, right? <laughs> So going to Intune, come on, give me power. So, come on, come on. Um, first, I like to show you the devices. Come on. Maybe I have to, to, to buy Ken a beer because he is working for Microsoft. But I can see more, <laughs> more as before. So I have read writes. Ah, now I can see my, my, my computer. And can I select it? Come on. 
Yes, I can select and I should have the white button. Yay! So, thank you for listening. Is there any question left? No. It looks not. No further questions, Birko. Okay. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, the session and uh, have, a, have a look on it and I hope it works for you. It needs a little bit um, the mind changing to get the things together, but I wish you all pleasure that you have to have. Thanks a lot for the session, Mirko. We'll have a short break now of 10 minutes and then we'll go further with session two of Peter the Tender. See you in a bit.
Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, we just had our short break, and I'd now like to introduce or virtually introduce Peter for the next session for tonight. Peter, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Tim. Um, good evening to the audience. Um, I hope you enjoyed Mirko's session. Um, I have to be honest, I've been using Intune for quite some time, and it's been a while since I looked at it, and it was actually pretty scary how much um, actually got changed in the meantime. Now, what I'm going to do here in the next 45 minutes is inspiring you, since it's somehow community based, uh, what it takes to build and deploy, uh, I would say, a community blog like a website on an Azure platform for almost zero bucks a month, where all the way at the end of the session, you'll find out that obviously, depending how exactly you're going to use it, um, the cost might vary a little bit. Now, I get a message here that my screen share is not working, but it actually should be working fine. So I'm going to kill it and trying it again. Just a second. Technology is nice when it's working, right? And that should be up again. Cool. So what you find out in the session topic is the combination of um, Hugo static website on the Azure platform for where we're going to use um, Azure front door. But that's all the way from beginning where we have nothing all the way to the end. And I'm going to walk you through and trying to do as much live as possible that you can deploy the exact same thing as I'm running on my production blog website in less than 45 minutes. So we're going to start with the static website creation, and obviously I'm just going to use uh, a pre-built basic um, configuration to start from, where obviously everything starts with your own technical intelligence and um, the, the quality of the blog post. So I'm not going to write blog post right now, but using the backend. Then once it's ready, we test out on our development workstation. We're going to move it to Azure, where we're going to use one of the newer features called static websites. And then depending a bit on your options or your choices, um, you can just run it. But I prefer using it in a secured way, a protected way, and spicing it up with some demos. You already know from the previous session, we have Q&A throughout the session, so feel free to fire off some questions my lovely assistants and the other side of the line will make my life easy and answering all the questions for me and all the way at the end if they don't have any clue how to answer the question i'll jump back and forth to the chat box and making sure that the question get answered so for the ones who don't know me um so again my name is uh, peter based out of belgium and for quite some time, I was pretty active in the community already. Um, MCT, Microsoft Trainer Community, and overall Microsoft community for years. And the last six years, I moved away from Exchange as my prime technology to the Azure platform. And I somehow loved it and sticked into the platform. And out of my own business, I was running um, a training company together with Azure Consulting and Architecting. And since yeah, almost seven months back, um, I joined an Azure technical trainer team within Microsoft, not a specific Belgian role. Um, out of all the places I've been so far, um, Belgium was actually one of the places where I didn't provide any training yet. So still happy that the community didn't forget about me and invited me to Spice, um, one of the virtual sessions that due to the circumstances we have to go through, but I'm going to try in the next 45 minutes to forget all your worries about COVID and family time and focusing on some fun, cool stuff in the Azure platform. Now, quite important is the starting point, a static website. What is a static website? I can imagine that all of you uh, can somehow imagine what it stands for. And it's a web page or a collection of multiple web pages that's having fixed content. So that's quite important where for uh, the last couple of years, a lot of organizations were investing in really cool, shiny, graphical, powerful 
but also expensive uh, web app platforms, where on the other side, a lot of them are just presenting content. Like again, in our setup that uh, I'm going to use here, if you want to present a, a blog website, um, sharing your knowledge with the community, you don't have that super expensive blown up um, web platform. On the other side, you might also have heard about single page applications or SPAs, but that's not a static website. Why not? Because we talk in the SPA setup, uh, we talk about an application and what it typically means is that those web apps, although it's a single uh, web page mainly, um, it's actually running client side scripts and it could be that based on your location, the content might be different based on uh, the browser you're using, based on the mobile uh, platform you're using, that the browser experience might be different. And that's typically what we do in a single page application. We're now with a static website. No matter what device you use, no matter from where you're logging in, it's always going to be the static page. Now, besides just creating your own um, HTML static websites, it's obviously not a, always that exciting, not that sexy. And that's where um, a lot of other platforms are actually jumping on that model. And this is just a list of um, a basic Google search. So what I did is literally top static website um, examples, and that's like the, the top five coming up. I only used um, Jekyll like three years ago. Uh, it was mainly, I would say, built and, and managed for, by developers. And the ones who know me know that I'm not that good in, in coding. So Jekyll was not really uh, my cup of tea. And I haven't tested out any of the other ones. Um, besides the one I'm going to use for the rest of my demos, and that's a platform called Hugo. Now, what is Hugo? It's um, a community-based open source uh, platform that gives you the static website um, look and feel, the static website concepts. But on the other side, it's not um, like only giving you the boring uh, web look and feel from like the, the early 90s when the internet started up. Next to that, if you don't really like HTML or you're not that good in the HTML uh, format, you could also use Markdown. Now, obviously, the question is like what's becoming easier, HTML concepts or Markdown? And I'll show you that it's actually pretty easy. And the other interesting part is that, again, it's free. Now, they have some kind of policy that they describe as free for mention. So what it means is when you grab a free open source theme from their website, as long as you keep a reference to um, the Hugo platform somewhere on your website, you're good to go. And like we say in community, sharing is caring. Um, I actually have to thank a lot of the, the content of this session. Um, like the, the starting point, like I want to build a website for the community, start blogging. What do I do? Where do I get started? And I actually chatted with uh, Gregor and some of you who have been following the Belgian community here this week. Um, that was the, the guy with a Scottish accent presenting on um, Azure certification um, earlier this week on uh, Tuesday night. So he somehow pushed me into using Hugo, where if you search for Hugo and how you can run it, uh, most of the examples you find is running on uh, GitHub open pages. Now, obviously, you could do the exact same thing, but since I'm living, dreaming in Azure, I was like, I'm going to run it on Azure, and that's where um, the whole session started. So with that, let's jump to the first demo, where we're going to build a new website from scratch. Now, you don't have to use Visual Studio Code to do that, but it's my favorite prime um, editor. And before jumping in all of this, I could actually show you a little bit about the Yugo website. So if you go to goyugo.io, you can find the whole description about everything they provide, how it's working a little bit on the, the concepts and so on. But obviously the power is really in the open source uh, themes, like a, a certain layout if you want for your website. You got a whole bunch of them. Uh, the ones they offer are the free ones, but similar to like WordPress, similar to Joomla, um, you have a lot of uh, web development companies that also build um, like really powerful graphically powerful templates 
um, and you need to pay for those. Now, just to keep it easy and not too heavy for um, creating my sample website here, because somebody was stupid enough to give me only 45 minutes, where I'm typically presenting 45 hours every week. So that's going to be a little stretch. But I found a little team. Uh, it's called Minimal. So what we're going to do is just selecting it and downloading. It's redirecting to GitHub. You don't need to be a developer to use GitHub. Um, even Intune experts like Mirko in meantime are using GitHub. So if Mirko can use it, then I'm pretty sure everybody of you can use it. So from here, we're just going to download the theme. The other thing we need is the um, Hugo application. So you go to the Hugo website, you download the Hugo framework. It runs on Linux, runs on Mac. I'm running Windows 10 for obvious reasons, and I already uh, prepped that install. So what I can do from here is from my command box, I could just run Hugo, and it's going to tell me like, sorry, I cannot find the website. Or I could go back to my Visual Studio Code environment and open a new terminal from here, and it's still going to do the same thing. So from the, the root of my. Nice. OK, so from the root of my um, my machine, I'm going to run. You go new site and I'm going to give it a name, the MCM. And that's all it takes, so super easy. So it's going to create a subfolder on my machine in the root, but it could be in any other place. And as you can see, step one, two and three, go to the team's website, download the team and copy some content. That wasn't all that hard. And what we actually did here in the back is super powerful because what we do with Hugo is actually running our own local website. So it could be the same as um, yeah, thinking of like an Apache web server, um, IIS web server, but you don't have to build all that. So we go to our local folder. We have the MC2MC demo, and it's creating this pre-baked um, web layout. Now remember that we downloaded our theme. And inside that theme, we do have uh, sample files. So what we can do from here is opening our sample files and copying it over. In the folder that we just get created out of Hugo, and it's going to override the content folder that we have, but it was empty anyway, so we don't really worry about it. And it's also replacing the config um, TOML file. Now, what is the config TOML file? It's the, the root configuration where you're going to define the, the behavior of your um, Hugo website. So that's um, a little bit you could think of like the, the CSS um, for the ones who are a bit familiar with WordPress or any other HTML based uh, web. Have to find what your website should look like. What's the team we're going to use? If you want to integrate Google Analytics, that's what you find. I'll build out a more interactive um, blog website. You can integrate with an open source um, disk and providing some parameters for your website. So first thing is re replacing the names and descriptions just to spice it up a little bit. The awesome MC2 MC demo by PDT, something like that. And anything else you could come up with, um, you could change the colors, you could change the layout if everything um, is always centered on uh, the web page if it's all to the left side to the right side so a little bit of layout um, but not that important for running our website so that's what we have for now the other thing is obviously building um, content so within the content folder i mean how hard can it be right 
we're going to create content. Where do we find it? Oh my God, there's a content web folder. Cool, let's use it. And I'm not using HTML. I'm going to use MD, which is Markdown. Now, what is Markdown? It's a uh, web standard, so all browsers and meantime support it. And what it does is relying on plain straight English text with a couple of characteristics, and that's going to present you a nice looking website. Now, back in the, the community aspect of a blog website that we're going to build, you can see that even the Hugo pre-baked templates are actually ready for that. So it starts with a title for the blog post, a date, some tags if you want, and a draft, which means that you can um, already create your blog posts, but not having them live yet. So another really cool um, something. So we're going to change the title, and this is the PDT, let's call it the live demo. We're going to change the date. That's a little bit old. I was actually pretty young at that time, but long time ago. And today, 23. I don't need tags because it's all pointing to development and I'm not going to do that, but you could use them. It's a little bit of marketing. And some text, so I'm going to remove this. Welcome to the blog post by PDT, and this is all live. So that's going to present itself as straight text. Everything you see in the, the blue part line 10, that's going to be a title. So that's a little bit of the markdown um, text setup that you need to uh, become familiar with. So we can do um, italic, we can do bold. That would be um, asterisk. Let's do A word in between two asterisks would be bold. Um, the hash, a single one is like header one, two of them is header two, three of them is header three. So if you again you're familiar with HTML, then it's actually pretty straightforward. I don't need anything else. So although it's a nice sample camera, might be a little bit better. And removing everything else saving it and we're going to test our website. So back to my terminal from here or in another window, it doesn't matter. And the next command is you go server. And nice, did I forget something? So it complains that it's not finding the minimal theme, although I downloaded it, I copied it. Let's check if I actually did copy it. I did not. I did. Let's see if that fixes it. I was too excited. I'm forgetting something. Content is there. That's the fun of doing live demos, right? Layouts, themes, that's all fine. I'm driving myself crazy. So looks the same. It's a different folder, not that important. I need to fix it. Gonna make it easy. What happened here? Do I really need to switch to my production environment to show you that? <laughs> that would be fun. It's all because I only have 45 minutes. Let's see what comes out of this. If not, then I'll just switch to I give up. Cool. What it should do is. If this is not running, then you can all have a beer. But this is running. Cool. 
that's why we have fallback plans. It scared me for a minute. Maybe Mirko took over my machine in the meantime and testing some Intune configurations, I don't know. But that's my local website. It's the exact same thing. I'm using the minimal theme. I created some blog posts, so up till now everything's the same. Besides the fact that I probably pasted it somewhere in the wrong location, uh, nothing to worry about. So I get a view on all my posts and back to my folder. Inside content, inside the posts, I got a couple of them. I'll open the latest one. Before I was using Visual Studio Code, you can still do that, but since I'm writing most of my documentation in Markdown nowadays, um, I actually wanted another um, tool. It's another free one, Markdown Monster. But as you can see, it's the exact same file, text-based with some Markdown characteristics. And as you can see here on the top with Markdown Monster, it's almost like um, you're switching back to like WordPerfect in the, the mid 80s if you want, but actually pretty cool. So we do have the website, we tested it out locally. And the next step is moving it to our Azure platform, where we're going to use one of the new features called Azure Storage Account Static Websites. So important, it runs storage as a service, so we are not deploying WordPress-like scenarios. We're not deploying um, a full Azure web app, for some of you are familiar with that one. The only thing we're going to create is an Azure storage account. The, one of the nicest benefits besides everything else I'm going to walk you through is that it's awfully cheap. It's painfully cheap. 0 0.20 US dollars, so that would be like 15 euro cent a month to run an Azure storage account with one gig of uh, 10 gigs of data. Now, if you paid attention to my markdown file, like a a 10 minute reading blog post that's probably like seven or eight K in size. That's really um, 10 gigs would allow me to create like three blog posts a day for the next five years, and I would still not have the two, uh, the full 10 gigs. Obviously, if you move up, then oh my God, it's going to become 50 bucks um, or 0 0.50 bucks if you have like 20 gigs, but you don't want to write 20 gigs of blog posts on uh, Markdown, I'm pretty sure, in, in at least one year. So it's an Azure storage account. It's HTTP, but preferably HTTPS. And again, cheap. And if you want, it's also high available. So your WordPress-like scenarios, your Azure web apps, your external hosting system, maybe still your um, Windows 2003 server at home, that you rebuild with Linux and Apache, it's not high available. Azure storage accounts are high available by design. And obviously it's supporting the static website. So what we're going to do is creating a new storage account where we need to define index.html. We need to define some error page and that's going to create a URL on the fly. Inside the storage account itself, it's going to create a web static folder called the dollar web. And from there, we're going to upload our file content using the good old FTP, using Storage Explorer. If you already um, know, then the demo is going to be a bit boring, but I'm going to show you or back to our Visual Studio Code integration. And for the true developers in the audience, if you're familiar with pipelines out of Jenkins, maybe Azure DevOps, you could integrate with a full end-to-end -end Git source control where you just upload a new blog post and from there everything gets pushed in motion. But I'm going to keep it pretty manual for now uh, to not make it super hard. So we're going to switch to our Azure environment and creating a new storage account. I need to pay attention, making sure that this part is working without any hiccups. But if not, we can always rely on the fallback scenarios. My assumption is that all of you are a little bit familiar with Azure already. Um, if not, maybe just shout out in the chat box like, oh my God, Azure is so hard, I cannot follow. Then um, I'll be more than happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one session and inspire you about all the cool things we have on the Azure platform. 
so this is some name for the resource group and we're going to do the pdt mc so at least i remember where i created it next the storage account name is something that needs to be unique across the world because what azure is going to do is creating a url for my storage account internet based it doesn't mean that the whole world all of a sudden can connect to your storage account but it's at least pointing to um, a public URL. And I talked about the replication high availability. I don't need it for now, but it can replicate in the same Azure um, buildings across different buildings in the same region. Or if you want even across multiple regions, if your blog becomes super popular across the world, you could build um, one storage account in Europe as your region and having it replicating to uh, somewhere US, somewhere APAC, or any of the other 57 Azure regions we have. So this is gonna take a couple of seconds, and that allows me to show you Azure Storage Explorer. It's almost like a file manager, and again exists for macOS, Windows, Linux. and storage account creation was even faster than Storage Explorer is opening. So the storage account is live. Think of it as a virtual, a virtual disk with some powerful features where one of them is the static website. It is really my day to day, awesome. Let's try that again. And this is an error that's out of my control. Did I create too many of them in my preparation? Static website. Authorization. Okay, if you really want to play it hard ever then we can survive from that as well. Doo, doo, doo. Even my file explorer. Oh yeah, there it is. Let's try that one. So I connect to my Azure account. It's not asking any credentials because I already provided those. Should I be worried now if I don't get access to my Microsoft environment anymore? Because it's like past noon in Seattle. Never know what anybody decides over there, right? So it's still okay from here. So let's see if re-authenticating fixes the problem. Nope, it doesn't like me, and I have no idea why, but that's why we have another one. There we go. Is it really that hard? Come on. So what we do is, first of all, enabling the setting. It's going to create a URL, so the PDT static and so on. It's a unique URL for my storage account, and it's asking for an index document name and an error document name. So I'm using index HTML using 404 HTML, but you could customize this. If you wanna call it the default HTML or the default um, markdown file, that would be fine. If you wanna call your error document, the, the error.html, that would also work or any other name you wanna give it. So this normally takes just a couple of seconds which means that now we can push um, our code. So I'm quickly going to switch. So it's a little bit of cloud magic today, but that's all fine. So what do we have out of our static 
uh, site configuration is this dollar web folder. So back to our altering development environment, if you want, where now we need to copy the source files. Now, the first thing we need to do, although we tested everything out on our local machine uh, using Yugo server, but that's only the local state. So what we're going to do is somehow, I don't know, compiling our website. It provides some statistics. So we do have 22 pages, so technically 22 markdown files. Um, a lot of other configuration files that are building up the web environment out of Hugo, but we're not really using those um, for content. And that's pretty much it. And as you can see, it takes about uh, 1300 milliseconds. So that's like 1.3 seconds to compile it. So from here, I could go back to my file explorer using the Azure Storage Explorer using FTP copying, but that's all old school. We're not going to do that because we're in Visual Studio Code. And what you can do is running an extension. So it's like a plugin to make Visual Studio Code. That's typically like a blown up notepad editor, but actually turning it in a full development environment. So you install the Azure Storage Account um, plugins. Obviously, I already did that step. And from here, in this little menu, I don't need to remember anything. I can just click through from here. So I'm going to deploy a static website. And this typically takes only a few seconds. There we go. It's going to ask me, what is your source folder? And let's pick this one. Recognizing your Azure subscriptions and pointing at the storage account itself. Where I'm going to use this one. And down at the right, it's starting to deploy. So it's going to ask me for confirmation because there's already some data from my previous test and it's going to copy. In that list on the menu, um, I'm doing a full deploy, but you could also update. So then it's only going to copy the new files. Uh, you could delete it from there. So if you don't have any familiarity with the Azure portal as such, technically you don't really um, have to use that. So as you can see, it's running a delete since I'm forcing a new deploy. And that's where the, the light teams are actually beneficial because my website, so that the actual uh, pages are only 22 in size, where um, the 49 pages is everything else outside of um, my actual content. It's the full um, Hugo layout. And obviously the more uh, I would say the, the more sexy, the more exciting uh, theme you select, obviously the more configuration files you have, which somehow is going to slow down your site, although it's still static, so it's not really going to uh, stop anything. So this is going to take another couple of seconds. Um, don't know if there's any questions in the meantime while we're waiting for this part to complete. Apparently not. So it's almost there. So I'm going to switch back. Connecting to the URL and my website is not running. Why not? And that's uh, again a little bit specific to the fact that we're using Hugo. If you just have static HTML files in the root of the storage account, then Everything's going to run fine. Now, what you go that with that um, compile comment. In the meantime, this is done. Awesome. What it does in that you go compile comment. Is creating a docs folder. So inside that docs folder, it's going to copy everything from the content. So that's my authoring environment and it's going to compile and squeeze everything in the docs folder. Which means if I connect to my storage account, I actually need to add docs and um, 
the location, so the subfolder of my files. So from here, you can see my website is actually running. And I can open a post, but then Merp, it's not working again. Why not? Because it's all static, which means I have to go back in. And if I add this Hugo compile folder, then I have my blog article. So again, this is specific to Hugo. So initially it freaked me out a little bit like, God damn it, GitHub is smarter than Azure. But I forgot to read the documentation and somehow forgot about that little um, docs, Hugo specific. If you use um, Jekyll or maybe other um, static site platforms, the scenario might be a little bit different. So that's somehow expected, right? So what we're going to do to fix it, since we want to expose this to the outside world, is first of all changing that internal web.core.windows.net because you want your, I don't know, 007 FFF learning custom domain. We want to make sure that the URL is always pointing to the public path or in my scenario, the docs, where, by the way, um, that subfolder that it's using for compiling um, is depending on your theme as well. So it, I tested it out with a couple of them, but it might even be different because it's the team uh, developer who decides on that. Next to that, you could see that the layout is not 100% correct. And again, that's partly because we're making ourselves a little bit more complex and the custom domain I already talked about. So how can we fix this? Thankfully, we can out of the Azure platform with built-in services, where option one is Azure CDN or Content Distribution Network. That's going to do some URL redirection, a little bit of caching, but again, for static files, there's not a lot of caching needed. If you want to move up to the next level and even be more professional, you would also add a full-blown load balancer into the story where you have application gateway. And if you have it across multiple regions because your website is super crucial and having it in one Azure region is not giving you enough high availability, or you find out that you have a lot of users from all over the world and you want to please them that they don't have all to connect to the West Europe site, but you want to share content across the world, then you could use Azure Front Door. So in short, CDN, but I explained it and showing you what it looks like. Do a little time check. 10 minutes, going to be perfect. If Azure is willing to support me with this, So we're going to create a new CDN. It's another Azure service. So this is the PDT CDN. Where I'm going to pick the cheapest one. Because it's community, it's blogging. We don't have a lot of budget. Any reason for having a cheap solution is good. And on top of that, it's all um, still full Azure professional services. So this is going to run for um, a couple of seconds, minutes. I don't know because Azure, as some of you might have heard, is having some performance constraints, and I'm pretty sure that the error message I just got is part of that. So I'm going to switch to my already deployed one. It's the exact same thing, but I'm not going to bore you with waiting for a deployment. And what do we, uh, okay, it's there, fine. And I'm gonna use the live one. I wanna do it all live. So now we're gonna create a new endpoint, the PDT CDN, hopefully not in use yet, cool. Where we can redirect, like what are we using in the backend? A storage, but that's wrong because we're not using the full storage account, but only a subsection. So we're going to use custom origin and it's going to ask me for the URL of my storage endpoint. I already forgot the name, so I just going to copy it. If it still allows me to go to that one, cool. So that's the URL I want to publish. 
And funny enough, it only needs the path, but it doesn't need HTTPS. And since it's acting as some kind of load balancer, if you want, um, website optimizer, it's recognizing like, oh, you're connecting to a web endpoint. In a full CDN setup, uh, it's also offering you uh, multimedia optimization and large file copying like Windows 10 um, updates or the new streams. Is um, also using CDN. So this is again going to take a couple of minutes to be honest. Um, the creation itself is pretty fast, but it tells you after creation that it might take up to 10 minutes. And that's the reason why I do have my fallback plan, not really as a fallback plan, but just to speed up the demo a little bit. Because once we have our CDN up and running and we define this endpoint, which for the other one is still running in the back. Technically, we should be done. So it's going to. See, I'm not even lying 10 minutes from here, so I'm smarter and prepping my demos. So what are we going to do here? And again, this is specific to uh, the Hugo way of presenting our content. We need to provide a URL redirection. So what we're going to do is whenever we connect to the source, which is that URL from our storage account, rewrite it to um, docs and add a and URL to them. And we're going to save it. So this means if I connect to this um, CDN name, in the back, it's going to redirect to my original storage account URL, but it's never going to expose it. So it's all Mm, hidden behind um, our CDN URL. And next to that, it's going to redirect the source to slash docs. So if I'm connecting to the home folder, it's going to redirect to docs and opening my post. So that's really um, what it should look like. And let's give that a try. So I'm connecting to the URL of my CDN. And from here, I can go to my posts, my about web page. I didn't configure anything specific here, but the website is running. So now it's somehow fixing at least one part of our issue list. So it's covering SSL, but it's now using a CDN certificate. Um, it's performing the URL redirection, but it might not be good enough yet. And that's where, and again, this is an option from here. You could add a custom domain name to CDN, like using your own, uh, like in my case, 007 FFF learning domain and using that one. So that would be perfectly fine. But just taking it one step further, because I got another few minutes, is why not adding a full blown professional um, load balancer into it. So up there we have two options. One is App Gateway, the other is Azure Front Door, where App Gateway is specific to an Azure region. So it can load balance all the traffic in that one region to the backends in that region, where Azure Front Door is allowing you to um, redirect load balance across multiple Azure regions or even in a hybrid model. So imagine that you run, um, you go, on your on-prem at home little server or laptop or PC, and that's your current public IP endpoint, but you want to migrate everything to Azure, it's going to take a little bit. You don't want to break your server, so you can already start with front door pointing to one endpoint on-prem, the other endpoint, um, the new Azure URL. So that's really how easy. The killer feature for using App Gateway or front door compared to um, just using CDN, in my opinion, would be session affinity, not that 
important for our website, but web application firewall. So it's a built in uh, web application firewall that's going to block off DDoS attacks. It's going to block off um, any content inspection. It's going to block off um, any other kind of traffic that could kill your storage account or even kill your full um, blog website. And that's going to be my last demo here. And let's hope our demo friends somewhere in the world are a bit supportive. However, now we're going to create a new Azure front door. And Tim or anybody else, if you want me to shut up because I'm running out of time, that's fine. But I hope you give me another few minutes and that would allow me to complete everything as Just it should be. No Just problem. go. Awesome. I love the Belgian community. They're so supportive. So Their what I'm doing is... Worth it, so. <laughs> What's that? Their drinks afterwards, so we have the time. Oh, you're buying? That's nice. Uh, uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send them over with the post. Uh, that's good. I got a funny side story on that that I'll tell you later on. What it, how funny it can be to send beer by uh, by post. Anyway, so what we're going to do is building a full professional load balancing configuration where it starts with the name of the front end service. So this is again going to be the MCI2 MC block site something. I can use session affinity. I can use web firewall. I'm not going to do that, but the capability is in there. Next, we want to load balance something. So this could be static site. And the backend similar to CDN. It's not any of those in the list besides the custom host. Same scenario. So that's what makes Azure awesome. If you know how to deploy CDN, then all of a sudden everything else becomes super easy. We're going to expose port 80443. If you want, I'm not going to show you, but you could create a rule that whenever somebody connects to port 80, you're going to block it off and redirecting to port uh, 443 by design. That's all here. There's obviously health probes, health checks, that it's not going to try to send anyone to the website in the back pool if your storage account is down or unavailable whatsoever. And then here, the last part is the public, well, let's call it docs, URL path. where I'm going to do the same as on my uh, CDN, where this time we're going to forward everything to the docs subfolder. And that's all it takes. So I still have admin power, so I'm still a Microsoft employee apparently. Still wondering why that static site tells me access denied. So this is going to create that other Azure resource. Again, going to take a couple of minutes maximum. And from there, we can connect to our front door URL. That's nicely going to redirect everything to the internal storage account. So last, well, pre last slide if you want, is what does this all cost? Because everybody knows that Azure is expensive. That's the reason why nobody is using Azure. I'm exaggerating a little bit. I can say that the whole world for the last couple of weeks is literally running on Azure. Now, the components we have, the two ones on the left side, is the, the bare minimum that we need. So we need the storage account where we enable static sites, copying the data. And next to that, we're going to use um, content CDN service to perform URL redirection. That's the first step. You could also use it with a custom domain. So, oh, by the way, storage accounts themselves also support um, custom domains, but that one is not working for the static website. So that's why we need another service in front of it. So the cost for the 10 gigs of um, capacity, the data we're going to use is 0 0.20 a month. So that's like two euro, well, two and a half euros a year 
for the static website. If you want to make it a bit more customer friendly, public facing friendly, then you're going to add CDN on top. And that's another 0 0.8. So easy set for one US dollar a month. So like 12 bucks a year, you can actually run your website. So why did I come up with five bucks a month? Because it depends on the region. It depends on how large your website is. Um, I can imagine that if you've been running your personal blog post for the last 10, 15 years, then maybe you have a bit more data than 10 gigs. Um, maybe you want to integrate um, a full functional uh, certificate and not using the built in Azure certificate, although it's a public one out of um, Let's Encrypt. If you don't want to use it, there's a cost for getting your um, official SSL certificate. So that's where the estimate five bucks comes from. Now, where it becomes interesting is that the cost goes up with a factor 10 once you start integrating the load balancers. So it's not the two of them. It's or application gateway and running in one single Azure region or moving to Azure front door and that's going to load balance everything in multiple Azure regions. Where technically, just to be correct, you also need to have two storage accounts in two regions copying the data. So just um, front door by itself is not going to detect that your storage account all of a sudden is available in a different region. So that would be the solution with ultimate security. It's like 500 a year. And yes, that's a lot more than WordPress, a lot more than your um, at home running physical box, but obviously it's also one of the most secured solutions. So all that to allow me the deployment of my front door. Where I'm connecting to my front door URL. And the nice thing is without doing anything that all of a sudden it's actually capable of recognizing the layout of my site. Remember that before my web pages were looking a little bit fishy where now all of a sudden everything looks pretty cool. And showing you that it's not just that one single page. I can click around. I can show you all the content on my website and. It's all running fine and it's super fast. Last thing, and that's where I'm going to switch back to my um, yeah, full running production environment. Is showing you the custom domain. Because once you have your front door set up, up and running, the last thing we're going to do is integrating a custom domain. So what we need to do there is going back in the front door configuration where besides our front door um, unique name, we're going to add the public domain name. Where here I could do, I don't know, mc2mc.be, where we're going to tell you, you need to provide a CNAM alias in your custom domain. Once the verification is done, you can enable custom domain HTTPS. And that's going to create a let's encrypt free, public, trusted, um, recognized in all browsers on PCs, Linux, Macs, iOS, Android, um, public certificate. So that would be the last step. But it's again taking a little bit of time because you need to create that custom domain. You need to wait for the certificate to be created. But that's what it takes. So with that, I have to excuse myself for being five minutes over time. Um, so a recap what we did. We started with the static website, the whole Hugo integration, if that's the platform you want to use. Again, you don't have to, if you just want to build static HTML files, then it's a lot easier. You just upload HTML and it's running, but that's a pretty boring session. Then we're done in five minutes. So we're going to move to the second part where we run it on Azure and from there doing some redirection with CDN. And again, that's only in case of the non static HTML um, directly in the root of the web folder. And then optionally extending it, you could move up to securing, <coughs> adding security protection, public certificates, custom domain names, everything that I showed you. And 
if you're like, oh, this is actually pretty cool, but I need a little bit more time to digest everything. Um, I have my blog post ready. As you know, it's in a draft mode. I just need to change that keyword, uploading it. And that's going to be my first official blog post at the MC2MC website as well, where I'm going to challenge the back office team a little bit because it's um, the first time I'm going to blog on the platform. But I think this deserves one since all of you have been super quiet. So um, I'm going to share the details and making sure that you can find everything over there. And with that, it's perfectly 10 o'clock in the evening. So only thing I can do is thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the session. You learned from it. Feel free to stay in touch and handing it over to our back office folks. OK, thank you very much, Peter. Um, well, yeah, wrapping up the session for tonight. Um, first of all, a big thanks to Mirko and Peter, of course, for delivering um, the two sessions uh, for tonight. Um, for you guys, also a big thanks as an attendee for joining us. Um, if all went well in the last couple of minutes, you will have received an email from us um, related to this event. And in that email, you will find two important links. The first link will bring you to an evaluation form. Um, this is the first time we're doing an event like this, a virtual event. And of course, we're always looking to improve and to learn. So if you have some feedback, please use that first link to provide it to us. Uh, it's always appreciated. And the second link you will find in there is, um, well, what we typically do if we have an event is that we hang around after the event with some drinks and some food. But of course, during, uh, under these circumstances of lockdown, we cannot do that. So we came up with something that's called a social bring your own beer. So what we would like to do is encourage you to run to the fridge, grab a drink, come back and click on that second link. It's a Teams invite where um, us guys from the MC2MC group uh, will be hanging around and also, uh, yeah, it's just a way to have an informal chat and, and hang out uh, with each other for a couple of minutes longer. So um, if you want to join us, please use that second link. If not, I wish you all a good night and hope to see you soon at one of our future events. Thank you very much.